titled The Foundations of Renewal. And the goal of this series, you may recall, is for uh, us to do some work that's going to complement the work that is happening in these revision small groups uh, that our church uh, is partaking in. I think there's 65 people in our congregation who are in small groups. And so we're going to be looking at a central idea or a Bible passage uh, that is uh, going to be studied this, uh, this coming week. Now last week we looked at the full idea of, uh, the, of a vision and the power of having a vision and the dangers of not having a vision. And this week in our small groups we're going to be looking at uh, the uh, mission context. Meaning the area around uh, our congregation and in fact also our congregation. And we're going to be reading from the book of Romans chapter 8 verses 18 through 39. This is one of the uh, richest and uh, most theologically dense uh, uh, passages in all of scripture. So I want you to do your best to attract with me uh, on this and see, um, see what uh, Paul is saying to us. We've been sitting for a little while, so I'm going to invite you to stand if you would, if you're able. If you're not able, don't sweat it. Let's listen to God's Word. Paul is writing, and he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves... We who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not really hope, he says. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, then we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought to, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs that are just too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so we know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, who are called according to His purposes. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. So what then? I mean, what then are we supposed to say about all of these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who then is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God the Father, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? hardship or distress or persecution or, or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. And then skip me the headline. No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor anything else in all of creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. Well, a platoon of World War II Marines 
was being briefed by the commanding officer on a very dangerous uh, beach landing that they were going to make on the shores of a beach in the South Pacific. Our artillery, the commanding officer said, has not been able to dislodge the Japanese. This is going to be an incredibly dangerous and rough landing, he says. We estimate that when the first wave hits the beach, probably only five out of 100 of you will survive. The platoon was deathly silent until a young Marine raised his hand and said, man, I sure am going to miss all you guys. <laughs> Denial. As somebody once said, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. The tendency for us to not see that which is evident to nearly everyone else in our lives is well documented. There are all sorts of things in life, aren't there, that we really just don't want to know about. And so we refuse to see them. For instance, we don't want to know about all of the bugs and all of the microbes and all of the creatures that make their living on our body. We just don't want to know about those things, do we? We don't, or else we couldn't hardly get up, right? You couldn't kiss your child. We don't want to know what's in Chicken McNuggets, do we? You don't want to go there, you know, or you never eat one again. You don't want to know where the dog who just came up and gave you a big slobber kiss has been. You just don't want to know these things, do you? And so we push them to the edge of our consciousness. In our groups this week, we're going to read about a woman named Gwen Crawley who was praying for a group of women who were gathered for a global women's conference. She prayed that God would grant the women at that conference, quote, the power to see and the will to change the what is to what should be. The will, the power to see and the will to change. That is my prayer for our small groups and indeed for our whole congregation. This week we will get the results of our congregational survey that we took back in December, and we will get the results of the, the latest demographic studies for the area around St. Paul Presbyterian Church. Do we have the power to truly see our church for what it is, strengths and weaknesses, and to see the community of Johnston as it truly is? And see, do we have the will to change, to adapt in response to what we have seen? Well, Romans 8 is kind of a case study in discovering the, the power to see and the will to change. It begins by allowing God's Holy Spirit to awaken within us a realization of the pain and the suffering of those around us. Now, I don't know about you, but in my own life, I, am, I often feel just bombarded um, by bad news on the TV, on the radio, on the internet. Every day it seems like there is just a steady flow of negativity that flows from the world uh, into my, my life and my sensory receptors. And so I often feel like I am almost forced as a coping mechanism to keep all of that at bay. The pain seems like it's so great that I cannot let it in, or at least I don't want to let it in. Though I don't want to admit it, I am probably far more apathetic than I would like to be. Apathetic. Apathy. It comes from a Greek word, apatheos. It's a compound word. A meaning without, and pathos meaning feeling. I have become a person without feeling, basically in order to survive in this world. And yet Paul tells us that when we become without feeling towards our world around us, 
that we not only cut ourselves off from our fellow human beings, but we also cut ourselves off from God himself and the work of the Holy Spirit. We know, says Paul, that the whole creation has been groaning as in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly while we await the, our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. We groan inwardly, says Paul. And when we do, we connect with the whole of creation and also with our Creator. Our world, says Paul, has been subjected to futility, and you can hear it groan, can you not? If you listen carefully. You can hear the world groan under the weight of the injustice and the violence and the loneliness and the sorrow and the oppression that is endemic to the world as we know it in its current state of alienation from God. And no one feels this pain more sharply than God. Several years ago, I was at a, a, a conference, and there was a speaker there who was talking about a time that he was praying for a friend of his who was caught up in the drug culture and was just totally destroying his life. And this speaker was saying that as he was praying, he, he just was in anguish uh, for his friend, and he, his heart just ached and broke for his friend. And in the midst of his tears for his friend, he felt like he heard God saying that he too was grieving for his friend. In fact, the speaker said, God told him that he was going to share with him some of the pain that he had for his friend and indeed for the whole world that was far from God. And immediately the speaker said, it felt as if an elephant was standing upon his chest. And he could barely breathe from the weight of the pain. And he rolled onto the floor. And he cried there for what seemed like an eternity. But what later on people told him was only a quick minute. And then he returned back to his state of hormones. And that is what God was feeling a fraction of for the pain and the sorrow of people who are far from God. God longs to be in fellowship with all of her children, and when he is not, his heart just breaks. God aches to be in connection with the world that God has made in his children. You know, I've, I've heard many people here at St. Paul share with me in my four or five months here some of the reasons why you would like to see St. Paul Presbyterian Church grow and add members. We want to see more young families, some people say. We want to see more kids being baptized. Um, we want to have more people to help with committees. We want to have people to help more with the financial load of the congregation. We're, we're tired of watching other startup churches in the Johnson area grow while we're not really growing. We want Logos to regain its previous numbers and the glory that it used to have, and so on and so forth. And there is nothing wrong with any of these reasons for wanting us to grow. And yet I cannot help but think that from God's perspective, all of those reasons are quite a bit lower down on God's list. See, I think that God wants St. Paul to grow because God's heart is broken. God just aches and yearns to be connected to all of the people in Johnston, Iowa, who do not know him or who do not have a place where they feel God's love. People who are wrapped up in their careers or people who are desperate to start a career. People with big houses and shriveling hearts. People with no houses and broken hearts. People with every gadget in the world, but no reason to get up out of bed. People surrounded by crowds, but who are yet incredibly lonely and feeling like they are isolated from all of the people around them. God's heart aches for them all. And God wants to use you and I to reach 
them all. And yet, so often, we just can't see it, can we? We just can't see it. We're a bit like the man who was born blind. Maybe it's just too close to us for some of us. We've been here for too long and we can't see what's really going on. And so we pray for Jesus, like the man born blind, that he would spit on our eyes, that we can see, that we can see ourselves, that we can see the community surrounding this congregation like God sees it. The second way we can gain the power to see and the will to change is by living in hope. Because even when we struggle to see God at work in the world around us, we have this inner assurance that God is indeed still at work, that God has not forgotten us, and that God will liberate all of creation someday from this pain and this sorrow that it currently is in. In hope we were saved, says Paul, and so he considers the sufferings of this present age nothing in comparison to the glory that's about to be revealed to him and indeed to all of creation. Paul says, it's nothing in comparison to the glory of this vision that I have of what it's going to be right when Jesus comes back and sets the stage and puts all things in the way they should be. And so Paul has hope and that same spirit that groans inwardly in sympathy with creation also wells up in turn, internally into eager longing, according to Paul. A longing that inspires us to faithful living in the here and in the now, knowing that our future is secure. Martin Luther King, Jr., whose birthday we will celebrate tomorrow, lived with that kind of hope. On the night before his assassination, he said the following. He said, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've been to the mountaintop. I won't mind. Like anybody, I would like to have a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he has allowed me to go up to the mountaintop. And I've looked over that, and I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, he said, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. But my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The night before he was killed. Martin Luther King lived in biblical hope. Martin Luther King died in biblical hope. A hope born of a vision of a glorious land in the world to come that empowered his vision of a new and a better land in the world that is. A vision of all people, of all races, working together in unity for a better society. A vision that has yet, we know, to be fully achieved. A vision that we must continue to work on. Cain had the power to see and the will to change. How about you? How about you? Let's pray. Lord, spit on our eyes so that we can see. See our community the way you see it. See the world through the lens of hope and act in this world, realizing that if you are for us, then in the end, no one can be against us. Spin our eyes, Lord, so that in the end,
we, like Paul, will be more than conquerors through him who loved us, realizing that nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. To him be the thanks, and to him be the glory.